Thank you. Welcome to the Wednesday, November 7, 2018 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Thank you all so much for coming. Apologies to folks standing in the back. I'm not sure if there's an empty chair. Folks want to raise their hand and, uh, around. Uh, we had our national exercise in democracy yesterday. <laughs> yet another uh, local uh, exercise in democracy tonight. So thank you all so much for coming out to speak for or against the proposals that we have on the table. Um, the purpose of tonight is to hear your views on one of the, or more, of the eight proposals mm. that are before us for this round of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, one thing I want to say from the get-go is that we have somewhere around $800,000 available to us to spend of your taxpayer money for both the fall and the spring cycle. For the fall cycle, we have $1.6 million in ads. Okay, so we have $800,000 to spend for both cycles, $1.6 million in requests for this cycle only. The $800,000, there's a sort of asterisk that some of the money we're spending uh, is money that we bonded for Florence Fields, for Plath and Park. So we actually have a little more money to spend, but it's not a discretionary amount that, 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 we, that we can be doing. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is just a couple quick uh, items and then get going with listening to you as you come and speak, again, for or against a proposal. People get really nervous, particularly when there are a lot of people here. So we appreciate that for some of you, this is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, there will not be dialogue between us and you. Our job tonight is just to listen. So relax, we won't be asking you questions. We won't be um, And it's great for us to hear your thoughts. And it's really important since it's your money that we're spending that, um, that, that we know what you want us to do with it. Um, I can't imagine, but maybe I'll be surprised, with this amount of people wanting to speak, that we will get to our deliberations tonight. We have eight proposals that we're looking at, uh, and you are welcome to come to any community preservation committee meetings at, meeting at any time to hear our deliberations. Generally, we meet on the first and third Wednesdays of the month in the fall, and the spring at this time in this place, uh, where because of the holiday Thanksgiving, we're actually going to be meeting next Wednesday at seven, and that's when we'll be doing a lot of our deliberations. So you're certainly welcome to come to any of those meetings uh, at at any time. Uh, the way that we're going to do this is that those again we have eight proposals. Those proposals with the fewest people who have signed up. Uh, we'll, at, we'll, we'll have go first, so they don't have to sit through the community garden folks. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to. Uh, that came out wrong. Uh, they don't want to, but uh, we appreciate that you may have other things you want to be doing this evening. Uh, so it's fine for you to say your spit, do your spiel, and then and then uh, and then leave. So that's that's okay, okay to do that. Um, so. I'll go through the order in just a minute uh, while we get through our other quick items of, of, of business. When you come up to speak, if you didn't sign up, that's fine. The sign-up sheet was really for us to get a handle on how many people are speaking for each proposal. So it's fine if you didn't sign up. Well, plenty of opportunity to hear all of you. Do be respectful of time issues and the fact that there are so many uh, folks who, who, uh, who want to speak. When you come up, if you will simply state your name and your address. Uh, that's, that's helpful for us. We get speakers from other towns that come, so it's fine if you don't live in Northampton, but are supportive for or, or not supportive of the different proposals. So you don't have to be a Northampton resident to speak, but we would like your name and address. That's okay. Okay, everybody knows what's going on? All right, a couple quick items before we get to you. Uh, the first is, um, is there anyone, we, we start all meetings with general public comment, is there anyone who wishes to speak to CPC matter, matters that do not have to do with any of these eight proposals? Okay, 
We'll move on to approval of minutes. We have Sarah sent us out to September 19th minutes. Is there a motion to approve? Seven. A second? Second. Uh, discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, moving on. Uh, chair's report, just a couple quick uh, items. Um, one is that Sarah was able to pin down a date with Stuart Saginaw from the Community Preservation uh, Commission. He will be coming on December 5th, the first Wednesday in September. So if you will mark your calendars, uh, Stuart Saginaw is the director of the statewide uh, Community Preservation Coalition and is asked to come and speak to us about, about the, the role that they uh, the role they serve. Um, Stuart has asked for 45 minutes, so we're going to begin the meeting on December 5th with him. That may or may not be our only agenda item. The other thing, and, I, and again, I can't remember which of us get the minutes from the, from the Community Preservation Coalition. I think we all should be getting those. Uh, but there is additional money that the state has coming in somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 million, uh, which will be distributed to all uh, of, the, of the CDC. And again, with Boston on board now and Springfield, uh, what that means for us is probably pretty limited. There will be some additional money. The things that Sarah and I read seem to indicate that we won't know that until after our deliberations. So that money would be coming in and we would roll that into the, into the day. All right, so uh, you folks are up. Um, again, we have eight different proposals. Let me just read them to you. We have three uh, that came through um, Planning and Sustainability, Parks Brook, Pine Barrens Land Acquisition Project, uh, the Burt's Ball of Multi-Use uh, Trail Creation, and the Conservation Park Accessibility Improvements. We have the Northampton Community Gardens, invasive Japanese knotweed remove, yeah, removal. We have the Village Hill Apartments, the North Quabbin, I'm sorry, North Commons, which is an affordable housing project. We have the Forbes Library Restoration Project, we have the King Street Armory Historic Preservation Project, and we have the Florence Field Park Improvements. In terms of the sign-up sheets that we put out, no one was here to speak to the King Street Armory. Is that correct? Raise your hands if you did want to speak to that. Okay. No one is here to speak to Florence Recreation Fields. Is that true? Okay. Moving right along. Uh, to the... Um, Conservation and Park, uh, Park and Conservation Accessibility Grant. Okay. Uh, so let's begin with, uh, again, we're going by the fewest signatories. And again, folks are welcome to stay through the, through the whole bill, the whole meeting, but you do not have to. Village Hill Apartments, uh, which is an affordable housing project at, uh, at Village Hill. We had a couple of people who uh, signed up to speak and have other people uh, did so as well, so, uh, we'll, we'll put you on the list. Uh, first up was uh, Alex. Uh, I'm Alex Jarrett. I live at 8 High Street in Florence. Um, so I uh, love having Meadowbrook uh, in my neighborhood, and I love the, the diversity that it brings. Um, and uh, so I want to speak in, in favor of more affordable housing. Um, so, ways that it affects me, um, so I'm a worker owner at the Pedal People Cooperative, and increasingly more and more of us can't afford to live in Northampton. Um, we need to commute in from outside. Um, most, a lot of my friends can no longer afford to live there as well. I lived here about 20 years, and um, in that time, inflation has gone up one and a half times. But um, housing and rents have just about doubled. I don't know where wages are in there, but they might be lower. Um, and so just looking at the economic disparity and the unjust class system that we are part of, um, we need to fix that. And one step we need to take is um, to take every step we can to counter the rising costs of living here. So. Um, <clears throat> adding, you know, this is one step, which is adding more affordable housing. And I think that this project will leverage, uh, the, the CPA funds will leverage, will be leveraged very well. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Todd? Uh, 
Hi, I'm Todd Weir, 124 Mosier Street in Northampton, and I'm also the chair of the Northampton Housing Partnership. And uh, as I was getting ready for tonight, I looked at my remarks last year on housing, um, when we had, I think, four projects from three different uh, organizations that were coming up. And, and just so that we recall the history, um, that was over 100 units of housing that were in those four projects that came before you last year, and you approved all of those, uh, which thank you very much. Um, it went a long ways towards closing the gap between the money spent on affordable housing and some of the other um, areas that CPC funds can go for, and I think that's really great. And so one of the things I was looking at, I tried to visit all these projects as they've been breaking ground or moving people in and so on. And I think we're already seeing um, a tremendous difference um, based on the decisions that you made last year. Um, especially one story I want to tell is I went to the Habitat for Humanity groundbreaking um, out on Glendale Road on the next three units that they're building out there. And it was really inspiring um, because they had the three families that were moving into the Habitat houses. And each family told a little bit of their story of how they got to where they were. And um, they, they'd all you know, gone through some kind of struggle. Either somebody in the family had a health problem and was no longer able to uh, work and the family income went down. Um, one family was from Egypt, one family was from Latin America and living in the community. And, and to hear their stories about actually being able to have a place to live that was theirs in a home um, and seeing, you know, really the lives of families really being, having a great impact um, to have affordable housing here in our community. And um, as, as going forward, um, we have one more project, the, uh, the next step with Village Hill and the Community Builders Project that would complete kind of the pipeline of all these things that were coming last year. And, you know, a hundred, more than a hundred new units of housing that are um, close to downtown, that are uh, on the transportation lines and so on, is, is just, maybe transformational sounds like too big a word, but it's a significant impact, it's probably the biggest impact for low-income people of anything that's happening in Northampton right now. Um, so I really urge you to um, kind of stay the course and finish maybe the last jewel in the crown here of this particular pipeline. It may be a couple of years before we have another big project um, that comes along. Um, and I urge you to um, support it and thank you for your past support and uh, i'll also say that i'm a neighbor to the project on village hill it's a block away and i think it also um, completes village hill in a good way um, and and balances out the the affordability of the project up there um, so thanks again i know you have some very difficult decisions ahead of you and i appreciate all of your support for affordable housing Thank you, Todd. Anybody else to speak for or against Village Hill Apartments? Oh, there's a lot. <coughs> I don't know why. Hi, I'm Danielle McConnor, that's at 32 Perkins Avenue. I'm here to speak in support of this project. It seems like a pretty good deal for the city to me. Less than $6,000 per unit leveraged uh, to get a lot of affordable housing. Um, in addition, it hits a bunch of other hot button issues for the CPA committee as well as the city, <coughs> passive house design, preserving open space, providing a playground for the larger community, and just all around seems to you know, round out the village hill development um, and you know, really add some great quality affordable housing units to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, I'm Jack Horner and I live in uh, Florence. And uh, many, many years ago, I had the honor of being the first chair of your committee. So I have a very good idea of the work that you do, and I want to start by thanking you for it. Um, I was also around about that time um, uh, a chair of the Housing Partnership, uh, and in that role, I represented the partnership uh, on the State Hospital Citizens Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. So I have a long history uh, with their redevelopment of Hospital Hill um, as well. So um, 
and I have a long history of supporting uh, projects that Valley CDC has done. Um, and I, I don't need to tell you of the value um, that they are. Um, I'm just here to say um, that the road to, um, to redeveloping hospital health has been a really, really long one, decades in fact, um, and this project is a really important part of that, um, and it needs your support. Um, and one uh, final comment, I understand that there is an open space component uh, to the project, uh, and when we put together um, uh, the, the rules and the procedures and the policies of the, um, of the committee, um, one of the things we certainly um, focused on was that if a project uh, could um, impact more than one of the three program areas, um, that that should be counted in its favor. Um, and so I, I urge you to take that into account. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. My name is Steve Jones. I live at 123 Black Birch Trail, and I'm sort of a neighbor of this project, and I just want to speak strongly in favor of anything that increases affordable housing in my hand. And I think that's a, a, a goal that we have that we don't meet completely, and this would be a big step toward it, so I support the project. Thank you, Steve. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Haxby. Um, I live at 74 Village Hill Road. Um, I'm here to speak to my wife, who had uh, planned to uh, give a, um, uh, a little uh, a presentation. Uh, she's not able to come, so I volunteered. Uh, we've both been residents of Northampton for over 40 years, but have been at Village Hill for the last three. Uh, I'm just here, I'm here to speak for her in favor of, of the community builders, which has been a really great uh, 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 institution uh, that's doing this project, uh, that's proposing this project. Uh, Beth started her, uh, began supporting TCB when she represented the Village Hill community in uh, requesting the addition of a playground in the, uh, in the plants. And TCB has been great in working with her and uh, they have incorporated a playground into their plants. So they've just been a, a great neighbor. They already uh, Okay, I'm going to read what she wrote. <laughs> uh, she spoke last November to the state body, presenting a letter of support for TCB. Uh, there were 20 residents who undersigned at that time. We have 34 signatures on this paper, not including Todd. Um, community, community builders have now received funding for the first of two proposed developments. Um, uh, the first one was a 12-unit um, uh, building. This is going to be a 53-unit apartment building. <clears throat> uh, many other residents have been strongly in support of the community builders in this last uh, big development on Village Hill. Uh, as you're aware, Village Hill is a planned community designed to create a, a, provide a variety of housing options that incorporate sustainable, energy efficient design and available to people with a wide variety of incomes. Com community Builders was the first developer at Village Hill. Um, who built new residences and remodeled some existing residences from the uh, state hospital. They set a standard for green building and aesthetic design and affordable housing, which was has then been continued in the construction that is followed by other builders. TCB is incredibly receptive to community input in their pre-design stages, design stages, and post-design stages of construction. They have listened to concerns and responded to changes to the, of, their, of their plans and inclusivity of the community uh, and initial neighborhood concerns focused on creating building plans that preserved as much green space as possible, <coughs> uh, which they have done so. And this plan, I think, also includes 30 acres of open space right down to the Mill River. <coughs> in their initial stages of design, they organized meetings with, for the whole, with the whole community involved, with small groups and individual community members uh, in evenings and weekends. They've attended some of our monthly Village Hill Resident Association meetings and, provide, and, uh, and proposed, showed us their proposals. Uh, they responded thoughtfully and promptly to uh, requests for more information and other overtures. Uh, it's a testament both to the overall design and the maintenance and care given to the existing TCB properties on Village Hill. Many homeowners in the neighborhood are unaware that many of the apartments are, are
are mixed income housing properties uh, and there's a continued, there's always a waiting list for those apartments. Uh, with the first building now funded, TCB is focusing intently on the larger project, uh, benefiting the uh, community at large, uh, providing more needed housing. The following uh, are some of the benefits. Uh, 30 acres of open space will be preserved. Uh, much needed uh, creatively designed playground space for all the entire village hill neighborhood. It'll be a public playground as well, of course. Um, the, a larger community at Village Hill has shown a lot of interest in, uh, and is actually working to provide some additional funding for the playground itself. <coughs> uh, TC is committed to providing new and extended uh, walking trails um, uh, around the neighborhood and have supported, um, uh, uh, supported this component of the whole neighborhood. Uh, we are very happy to have TCD as our neighbors on Village Hill and uh, I support this uh, project. Thank you so much, Bob. Do you have, is there petitions that you said you have? I do have, yeah. Can you leave those with Sarah? Yeah, I've got a couple of copies here. Yeah. That would be helpful. Okay, anybody else for Village Hill Apartments? Go ahead. No, I'm not going. Oh. You, no. <laughs> Just full of polite people here in North Hampton. So, so uh, my name is Anne Marie Martino, and I live at 60 Pioneer Knowles in Florence. So, I am here, however, in my capacity as the site director for the Department of Law Health. Uh, for Hampshire County, which means that I oversee all the contracts the Department of Mental Health has um, here in Hampshire County to afford services to uh, people with mental health challenges. I have, however, um, worked in the Northampton greater area in mental health, I hate to say it, almost 40 years now. And um, I will say we've come a long way since the days of Augie's, of the Shaw's Motel, and making sure people get a cup of soup at Kathy's Diner. So, we want to support this development because some of the units will be designated to individuals that I serve. Mm -hmm. This hospital, of course, the Hospital Hill, had uh, a great initial start when people had um, a vision of providing um, a wonderful space for people in the community where they could <coughs> regain their health in being surrounded by a beautiful environment, and that is actually one of the great strengths that we want to afford some of the people that we serve. As was mentioned previously here, a great challenge in our area, and especially in Hampshire County, are the clients I serve in Hampshire County are much more stressed and limited by the cost of housing in Hampshire County than my colleagues struggle with in Holyoke, Chicopee, or Springfield, or other areas. So it is uh, with great delight every time I hear about a development that could afford uh, some subsidized apartments for people that we serve to go to. I would like to say uh, that many of our, our clients who that we serve are, are challenged financially and for those of you who may not be aware of it, a, a normal SS I payment runs about $700 a month, and SSDI, depending on your work history, not much more. So one of the uh, visions of the Department of Mental Health in our Housing First initiative is to really be committed to Housing First. But back to Hospital Hill and the State Hospital property, I do want to say that I think that supporting this development really supports the vision that this community has carried to, to care for individuals with needs, and that's a beautiful vision. I was at the I was at the uh, um, commission of the um, walking bench in what we call the dog park that the national that our city's historical society has supported, and that was a very uh, moving day when that <coughs> happened. And um, it reminded me again of the caring that we need to afford our neighbors who are challenged. And the needs they have around housing, especially housing in reasonable and or beautiful environments so that 
we want to provide with some people who perhaps in the olden days would have been in the same hospital, but now what a wonderful change that they'll be in that arena with open spaces, with places to walk, and in environments that are aesthetically pleasing. Therefore, I want to tell you it is very, uh, with, again, great excitement that I want to tell you that, that we have um, 10 designated units in this development. And let me tell you, it'll take about about 10 seconds for me to get folks into those places because there's quite a few people needing support. So I really want to thank you for your attention and I want to thank you uh, for uh, your devotion to uh, what this development would mean to our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Julio Alex. I'm a resident of Northampton. Uh, I'm here to speak in favor of the Village Hill project. Um, I want to start with a personal story, if I may. Uh, I have two sons who are in their mid-20s, and um, a few, well, who were in their mid-20s a few years ago when we spent the entire summer looking for an apartment that they could possibly afford to rent. And we found nothing, and we found very little that they could afford, even with my assistance. And I think that you don't have to, to have sons in their mid-twenties, and you don't even need to, um, to know many people in Northampton, to know that many people, many renters in Northampton are, uh, are rent burdened. Um, and that this is especially true of, uh, of small families, that the, the, the number of small families uh, has, has greatly increased uh, in, uh, in, in, in relation to, to, the, to the population as a whole, uh, for, for, for example. Uh, I, I think Village Hill addresses this problem and meets this need. Uh, and that this is, a, well, as, as has been said before, is a relatively infrequent moment uh, that, that you have here to make a difference in residents' access to quality, uh, affordable, Act um, uh, housing, and I think, as again has been said before, and that I will echo, that it'll make a difference to all others of us who uh, live in Northampton in becoming the kind of community that I think we aspire to be—a uh, welcoming, diverse community that's um, uh, uh, marked by uh, a deep sense of well-being. So thank you. I, I should also have said that I'm a member of the Housing Partnership. Thank you, John. Anybody else to speak for or against the Village Hill Apartments? It's a tough act to follow. <laughs> so articulate. So thank, uh, thank you all, all eight of you, I believe. And again, you're welcome to stick around for other projects, or your, we will not think you would you go. And leave at the same time. Okay, last call, Village Hill. Uh, next up on my list is the Parsons Brook Pine Barrens open space. This is uh, uh, open space that would be purchased by the city to become conservation. Uh, I've got Adele at the top of the list. My name is Adele Franks. I live at 123. Blackbird Trail in Florence, and I, I have to say that um, <clears throat> I haven't been to a CPC meeting in a long time, but um, back years ago when I used to come, you didn't have as many really good proposals as you have to consider right now. And when I looked at the proposals that you have in front of you tonight, I was uh, amazed and um, encouraged, and I imagine it would be a very difficult decision for you all to decide how to spend your, your dollars uh, because these proposals are, are really so excellent. And um, this one in particular I wanted to speak in favor of because I think that this particular 87-acre um, parcel of land is a real unique resource for Northampton and is one that we really need to make sure we don't lose to development. So I wanted to speak in favor of permanently protecting it. It's a unique parcel of land that has multiple benefits, including uh, preserving core habitat for rare and endangered species, and uh, preserving also this area for human recreation. It's already being used for human recreation, and under city and um, 
uh, orchestral land trust management will be even more accessible to more of us to explore and enjoy. So um, I hope you will find uh, the funds to fund this project fully. Thank you. Thank you, Del. Uh, one quick comment of what Adele said. Um, for those of you that want further information on all eight of these proposals, uh, you can find that at the City of Northampton's Community Preservation Committee website, where all the proposals in their entirety <coughs> are done. So thank you for reminding me of that, Adele. Uh, Mark? Good evening, everyone. Mark Walmsley, 1086 Burke's Pit Road also the Land Conservation Manager with Kestrel Land Trust. Uh, I have had the absolute pleasure of living next to the Parsonsburg Pine Barren property for the last 11 years. Uh, and one of the interesting things when I just think back on it is when I first moved into the neighborhood, so many of my neighbors had actually assumed that this property had already, already was protected by the city. Uh, it was so beautiful, so many of them were using it for so many different things. Uh, and I think they were shocked to learn that it was still part of the old Willard Sand and Gravel Company. Um, and in the intervening years, I've certainly understood why people might have thought it would be conserved. I, I've had the pleasure of watching just about every imaginable type of animal filter down from the Sawmill Hills along Parsons Brook and then down into what turns into Bassett's Brook down along the Park Hill area of East Hampton. Uh, bobcat, fisher cat, bears with cubs, fox, coyote. I have found an endangered wood turtle, uh, mink, you name it, I've seen it. it, it it's pretty amazing. Uh, during migratory bird season, the beaver ponds on Parsons Brook fill with dozens of waterfowl every day, flying in and out. It's a major flying, it's really wonderful to see. Uh, and at any given day, uh, during the year, in the warm months at least, uh, you can enjoy watching uh, great blue heron lazily fly overhead, sometime in groups between a heron rookery on Parsons Brook over to Burt's Fog, which is obviously part of another project today, which is really wonderful and again special to see. Uh, my son, a number of years, who's now six, learned to fish on Parsons Brook, uh, and I've since learned that he's absolutely not the first. Uh, generations of people have been recreating back on the property, fishing. I've run into any number of people from many different walks of life back there, long-term residents, to many members of new immigrant communities to the area and to the country who enjoy fishing back there. Uh, I've met any number of my neighbors uh, and met, made new friends on the trails back there. There's an extensive trail network on the property. People run, people cross country ski, snowshoe, mountain bike. Um, just the other night, uh, I just wanted to recap one little anecdote that just kind of just reminds you how special the property is. A few nights ago, my son and I shared a special moment sitting out on my back deck, and for around an hour, we listened to great horned owls calling back and forth to each other in the woods on this property. So even though this is an old industrial property, there's some magic back there. Uh, and I'm really excited that more people may get to experience that magic. I'm excited that this project may very well leverage more land conservation on adjacent parcels. I know there's different developments planned, a solar project and a cannabis facility. Uh, I know the city has been in contact with both of them and has asked for them to potentially donate more land along the brook so a trail can be developed from this parcel along Parsons Brook, accessing the full length of the brook, and it sounds like many of the developers were amenable to that. Uh, and I'm just really excited that this land may finally be conserved, uh, achieving a status that uh, many of the neighbors already thought uh, befit it. So thank you very much for considering. I know you have some hard decisions, but uh, thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Jeff? <coughs> Hi there, uh, Jeff Manick. I live on it's West Hampton Road um, near the Pine Barrens, and I just wanted to come and express my support for the city to purchase that. Um, it's a really tough act to follow. Everybody else is <laughs> for me. But um, if I could just quickly uh, share an anecdote that um, Last week, a coworker of mine was visiting the area, visiting our office um, from the West Coast, and as I took him around, he was completely amazed at um, how Northampton had such an array of culture mixed in with so much wilderness. And I think that um, you know, I'm sure everybody here knows that and appreciates that, but it's really uh, nice to hear from somebody's. Uh, point of view from outside our area and to really remind ourselves of how lucky we are 
and I just want to say that I absolutely support uh, developing more of this public land. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Anybody else like to speak on the Parsons Brook Pine Barrens? Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, David Hershop. I live at 22 Woodburn Way in Northampton. I'd like to speak in uh, support of the city's purchase of the Pines Barren uh, property. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, accompanying Mark uh, several years ago uh, visiting the, par the property, and I was really struck by uh, the diversity of wildlife and the terrain there. And I think it would be a great addition to the neighborhood and, and, the, and, and the city. And uh, it's something that is, is really should be very, very high on your priority list. So I hope when you make your deliberations, you will give it due consideration. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anyone else on Parsons Road? I know I'm not supposed to comment on projects, but Mark got me thinking this is a teachable moment. Does everyone know the sound of the great horn owl? Me too. Let's all do that together. Next up is the Forbes Library window restoration project. Uh, Julie? So my name is Julie Bartlett Nelson, and I'm an East Hampton resident, but I come to you as the archivist at Forbes Library in support of this project. Since 2004, I've cared for the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Library Museum and our Hampshire Room for Local History Collections. These are amazing collections documenting people, places, and events of our community's history from the 1600s to this meeting tonight. Um, documents, letters, diaries, account books, photographs, paintings, all there and all have unique storage challenges. Materials are used by scholars, students, genealogists, and residents of the city every day. The use ranges from personal interests like your own family history, the history of your home and property, um, some of the projects that are before you tonight were researched in our collections as well. Um, we also have people doing dissertations and scholarly publications. Last fiscal year, there were 700 visits to the local history collections in person and another 700 visits by email, phone, and online. Of these, 45% were Northampton residents, 40% from another town in Massachusetts, and another 15% from out of state in genealogy tourism. Um, in my 14 years, I've witnessed Forbes Library trustees, the City Capital Improvements Fund, and CPA, as well as private donors, invest in the facility improvements and protecting collections. And Windows um, restoration that we're here tonight for is the last piece of our facility needs. Um, we have done um, a new archival HVAC system this year, as well as previous projects reclaiming the entire building and repairing the slate roof. <coughs> For long-term preservation, our conservation specialists recommend archival collections to live at a constant 70 degrees and under, and humidity under 40 percent. And this, the humidity is our current challenge and why we seek the window project. Uh, the struggle to achieve uh, humidity in New England is very difficult. We spend all summer pulling it out, and we spend all winter pulling it back in. Um, with even with the <coughs> HVAC system just installed, we anticipate the winter humidity to be quite a challenge. To achieve these collections um, uh, conditions on the collections, uh, we see the windows completely iced over on the outside all winter in um, the archival storage areas and then the inside full of condensation and moisture, um, trying to keep the humidity proper um, and the effect on the windows. Um, and this puts collections at risk. So when you have moisture dripping down on the inside of the windows. Um, we've made a lot of investments of time and money to improve physical access and physical storage to mitigate these risks, um, but I've witnessed countless ice dams, um, icicles falling off, and just water coming down the inside of the windows. Um, so we are looking for the new windows to eliminate this risk and protect collections long term, and then just increase the energy efficiency of the <coughs> HVAC system. Thank you. Thank you, too. 
Uh, Jason? Uh, Jason Benson of the Facilities Manager at Forbes. Um, I've been working there for over 25 years, and for 20 of those years we've been trying to secure funds. Um, we've had three different architects come up with plans for this. We've had three different directors try to work on trying to secure funds for this project um, to no avail. Uh, the current um, plan we have by Margo Jones seems to be the best and the most historic of, of these plans. Um, I just wanted to say that it really would be nice for the envelope of this built beautiful building to be finally secured, and we really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Chris? Well, I'm Chris Mason. Uh, I live in Two Horse Street, Montague, but I'm here because I work for, as the city's energy and sustainability officer. Um, something I wasn't going to say in my notes, but I believe, I'm going to go back to the archive just to double check, but I believe Forbes Library is the only place that has a presidential library that is not funded through uh, federal funds. Yeah, it's not supported through federal We're the only presidential library in a public library. In a public library, right. So, and that's part of what needs to be protected through, with, with, you know, modeled uh, 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 keeping the humidity level and temperature stable uh, uh, of doing this. So um, I was asked to speak on some of the energy pieces of, to this. Um, I'll start with the bad news first. Um, this, you know, energy savings won't, uh, in a reasonable period of time, pay for this. Um, windows are, are a very expensive way to block up, uh, uh, you know, an air, air week, so it's not going to pay for it in 5, 10, 12 years, something like that. Um, uh, but the good news is, um, is that the method being proposed is to rebuild the windows, not build new windows, not buy new windows. And so by not buying new windows, you're not seeking energy into making new windows um, from an environmental point of view. Um, uh, the nice thing about this is that um, the rebuilt window, which will have double pane glass, um, uh, it's still going to save a comparable amount of energy to a new one. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's still going to increase the extension level um, a bit by adding glazing there and then the second pane to it. It's going to uh, reduce drafts um, uh, that bring in humid air, uh, yeah, bring in cold air that you have to reheat, brings in hot air you have to recool um, during times. Um, and it's going to allow for them to take the old window weights out and air seal and insulate around the window. So it's going to tighten it up quite a bit. There's going to actually going to be quite a bit of energy savings. Um, uh, the rebuilt windows will probably, almost certainly, outlive a, a new window that we bought. So what you have is this wonderful opportunity, these big, old, heavy windows. They have, uh, currently, they have quarter-inch thick glass. Um, so you imagine how hefty these frames are. <coughs> and the frames have lasted for decades and decades and decades. I'm actually not sure how long they've been there. Okay, how many? 125, 125 years. Wow. And you've heard some of the conditions they've been under. And the frames are still in good enough condition to put in a double, uh, you know, double glass glazing um, uh, and reuse them. From a preservation point of view, you've got the original windows. You've changed the glass in them, but you've still got the original windows, which is beautiful. Um, because of their long life, and I expect them to have a long life, this time when you replace windows, the energy savings actually might eventually pay for it. It may take 40 or 50 years. I don't have exact numbers on the energy savings, but because the windows are going to last long enough, you actually may get the energy savings to pay for it, which would not be the case with a new window that might last 20 years or so. Um, auxiliary benefits. Um, uh, um, I, I'm not living in town, I don't use a library, but I, I'll bet you people sit next to a window, they feel the breeze coming in. I know people working there do. Uh, so um, reduced uh, drafts uh, for added comfort. And of course, preservation, um, increased ability to manage humidity levels, um, reduce or eliminate the inside condensation and icing on the windows, um, preserve your uh, presidential library. Uh, so I'll uh, just be with that. Thanks, Chris. Anybody else to speak on the Forbes Library window restoration? Okay. Uh, moving on to the, we have two more projects. Uh, the first called multi-use path, and then we'll uh, close with the Northampton Community Garden. So, Bird Spawn uh, multi-use path. Uh, first up is Alex. 
Hello again, Alex Barrett, A High Street Florence. Um, I'm also here as uh, on behalf of the Pebble People Cooperative, um, speak in favor of this project. Uh, Co-founder and worker owner there. In 2002, there was just one trail, um, or one. I guess there was there was another one downtown, but one that uh, major trail, um, which went from State Street to Bridge Road. And as those expanded, um, you know, we were able to also expand our business. Uh, it's essential to our businesses are these trails that where we can haul things uh, very efficiently. And we haul for about 2,000 uh, city residents residentially. Um, and that they're also just a joy to be on uh, and year round, because many of them are now plowed. Um, and the network <coughs> is essential. And um, this new piece that's before you is a great piece to, um, to add to that. And when that finally gets connected, then, um, you know, not only will there be so many people who will be able to go directly into downtown who would otherwise have to travel on busy roads. Um, so, and once all those connections are in place, we'll be able to serve more neighborhoods as well. It is reducing, uh, especially the truck starts and stops. And every time trucks are very inefficient at picking up small amounts of stuff and starting and stopping and spewing out diesel fumes, fumes every time. So, um, so many benefits, seeing all the people enjoying the trails, being healthier, reducing carbon <laughs> pollution. Um, so for us and for the city, I encourage you to um, Prove the trail at Bird's Thanks. Thank you, Gail. Yvonne? Have you been on the bypass, the one that goes from Stop and Shop to Look Park on the weekend? <coughs> Isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> Don't we want to have other gorgeous places like that? Have you been out yesterday walking? Did you get soaked? Mm -hmm. Not just from the rain, but from all the trucks and cars passing through the sidewalk. <laughs> and this happens all the time. If you want to walk or if you want to bike on, on the sidewalk, you're going to get wet because the puddles are still there today. So that's mm -hmm. two days that you're going to get wet just walking on there. Mm -hmm. So I think a multi-use path, which we know we already enjoyed in Northampton, mm -hmm. and in addition to that, we're going to have some more of that, <coughs> possibly, right? Uh, pedestrian and cyclists uh, connect to the other towns. They, they're not just right here, but they can go to the other places, and they make new friends, and they meet new neighbors. and. Uh, Besides that, if you use your bike or if you walk, it saves the environment because you don't use a car to put all those fumes in the air. So I think this is a good idea to have an extension of that pass. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daniel? Good evening. My name is Daniel Call. 78 Randall Road, Western Massachusetts. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, you're right. I'm not a resident of Northampton, <coughs> but I did come up here. I was asked if I would come up here and speak to this particular project here. Uh, am I in support of this? Do I think you ought to do it? I would like to see, definitely, the CPC committee support the $200,000 that you're looking for, which would be a match to the other 200, which is a federal grant, making $400,000, which would complete that project. That's uh, located in the Rocky Hill Trail vicinity. Am I getting it right? I hope I'm getting it right. I did, I did download the information that from the CPC committee so that I could at least go over some tidbits about what the project meant. Met to not only you folks, but met to the 
town of uh, the city of Northampton. Um, rail trails. I've been doing rail trails and talking about rail trails since 1996. So they're not new. And I haven't quit. Why haven't I quit? I must like it. I must think it's a good thing. I think it's a great thing. I can remember stepping back 25 years and living here in Western Massachusetts. And how many rail trails did we have? One. In the making. The New Water Trail. <clears throat> but that wasn't a city. That was a state. And that was DEM at the town at the time. But I loved, as I'm sure a lot of other people, <coughs> once you saw it, once you used it, that's when you realized what it could do in many different ways to a community. For this particular project here, it is in fact about connecting. Connecting neighborhoods. And one more thing. You have a sensitive area up there, environmentally sensitive. And by in implementing this plan and doing it and constructing it, if I'm seeing and hearing correctly, it would enhance the protection of that particular area. I think that's a good thing as well. So, I'll be brief. You've got an awful lot ahead of you, still, all right. I, would, I do want to say that I applaud you for the project that you have on your agenda, that you've been working on for some time now. I will share with you that in Westfield, the Columbia Greenway, my responsibility <laughs> is to track the funding. And I've been doing that for two years and months to make sure that Westfield receives the appropriate funding for the downtown central section. If you don't know, it's about five bridges and five roads. And it meanders right down through Westfield, kind of cuts west, comes out by the south side of the Westfield River, where the bridge across the river is already finished and done. Now my point being, did Westfield ever come to the CPC in Westfield? Yes, we did. In FY18, $250,000. In FY19, this past July, 250. dollars For what? Because we had to, as all communities in the Commonwealth, are responsible for design. We were not going to get, as we did a couple weeks, weeks ago, the 75% design review by DOT if we had not put together $500,000 to complete the design. It's there. And the CPC in Westfield, members of the committee, were very, very favorable. They had seen the history they had benefit from what we've already built, and therefore they approved the funding. So it is a source of funding in the Commonwealth. Some people don't think it is, but today it definitely is. I appreciate you listening to me, and I would certainly appreciate your support for the city of Northampton. And thank you very much. One thing, could I leave my card with somebody? Sure, right <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. Uh, <coughs> My name is Paul Taylor. I live at 17 New Street, Florence. Um, I'm a member of the Friends of Northampton <coughs> Red Trails and the Abbey Bicycles and use the trails and the streets. And obviously we have, many people probably appreciate what a general system we have here for transportation, but I'd like to frame this a little bit differently. 
not only do we have a um, scenic city uh, byway of transportation, and which will hook up with, with all the other trails, but I'd like to think of this as a linear park, where this, this section will be three quarters of a mile, it can be used as for children to ride their bikes back and forth, or <coughs> parents to use strollers, maybe they can ride to uh, um, Ryan Road. My five-year-old grandchild comes from uh, Cambridge, rides a bike safely from downtown Florence, uh, Look Park, another great park. So I like to think this is more as a park as well as a transportation system like the Flint and Valley. So I hope you could support this. Thank you, Paul. Marianne? Yeah, I'm going to Good evening. <clears throat> I'm City Councilor Mary Ann Labarge from Ward 6. I am here this evening 100% of full support of Rocky Hill Trails at Burke's Bog Greenway. As a city councilor for going over 20 years, I have supported and fought for many, many, many pieces of conservation land. All the way from the quarry, which was a huge, huge fight that we presented to the owner of the quarry, and we were able to accumulate a tremendous amount of land. I am very supportive of this project. I'm very supportive of what we have done on Perspect Road of conservation land. I am going to give you my reasons why I'm supporting this project. If they build a 0.75 mile handicapped accessible trail through Burt's by Greenway, we will be serving people of all abilities, all abilities. We will be able to replace an informal design line trail that was created by users ignoring sensitive resources. And we will put respect and protect the ecosystem. They will knit together three neighborhoods, Ward 6 neighborhoods, very critical here. Sandy Hill, no sidewalks, no sidewalks. Very dangerous, they have to come out onto Florence Road. No sidewalks. Brookwood Drive, access out of Sandy Hill into Brookwood Drive onto Florence Road. No sidewalks. They either have to take the bus, if not be driven by parents. Overlook, same problem, no sidewalks at all heavily trafficked. Ryan Road School and Pertsburg Road. Pertsburg Road is extremely deplorable, deplorable condition. As a counselor, we have submitted in a petition last year, 150 residents. By doing that, <coughs> we have moved on and put that project in place. We've had surveyors <coughs> out there. It's extremely dangerous. And to put our children on that road, bad. I have to say, and use, and I'm going to tell you, any child, for an example, going from Sandy Hill Road <coughs> to the Ryan Road Elementary School could not walk the 2.1 miles to the school on dangerous streets and therefore needs to be bused or driven, like I just said. With this trail, that would suddenly be a <coughs> nine-tenths of a mile walk, and some families might choose to walk. So we are looking at opening up the door and doing what we call a walking bus. A walking bus. We're going to use the trails. Makes sense. And that's the right direction we should be going in. And I feel also in the long term, this trail will connect to the city's 11-mile multi-use trails, providing more transportation and recreation opportunities. <coughs> A CPA grant now will leverage the 200,000 federal grant that the city just received for the project. But we are not going to be able to spend it without the request of matching, matching funds. Please, please help us in Ward 6 and throughout the city to better the, lo the lives of people and our children. We have no sidewalks, only on new projects, 
that's it. I want to see, as a city councilor, to spend the CPA money where it should go, of protecting our children and families, and let them be able to be safe going to school, and this is the right direction. And I want to thank the CPA Commission very, very much, because you have a very difficult job to do. <coughs> and you just not, you cannot go ahead and support everything, but this is really <coughs> valuable. And I'm requesting as a city councilor, please help us make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Adele? Lawrence. I'd like to uh, echo what Marianne just said and uh, emphasize the health and safety aspects of this proposed multi-use trail and also to reflect on the fact that we are trying to get people in Northampton to use, uh, make less use of cars um, for a lot of reasons including uh, reducing our carbon emissions um, and People are really not willing to walk or ride their bicycles if they have to mingle with traffic, with car traffic, because it's dangerous and unpleasant um, and, 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 um, and really makes it impossible. And so I'm uh, urging you to approve this project because I think it will go a long way to connecting neighborhoods that are in, at the moment completely disconnected uh, from, the, from the trail system and make it possible for people to travel in ways other than by car, uh, and it will make it much safer for people of all ages uh, to walk and bicycle, as well as to enjoy the beautiful area of Berg Spa. Thank you. Thank you again, Doug. Uh, anybody else speaking for or against the Berg Spa uh, multi-use <coughs> My name is Mike Acrep. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you to support this rail trail expansion. Uh, I live in Greenfield. I operate and own a factory in Deerfield, Mass. But I spend a lot of time in Northampton enjoying the rail trails. I uh, ride them a lot. I meet people from all over New England who come to ride them. And you may not picture it this way, but <coughs> this local rail trail system is actually part of ecotourism. When people come from Connecticut, and they come from Boston, they come from upstate New York to ride the rail trails and spend money on hotels and on restaurants and on rent cars or whatever they're going to do when they get here. I met a couple last weekend who came up from Manhattan on the train, rented a tandem bike, got a hotel room, and they had a wonderful weekend here. One of my avocations is running a little bike group where I get together with friends and we uh, have larger bike rides and one of the favorite rides we do is we um, get a bus with a trailer, a small bus and trailer, and we go out to Rutland, Mass with our bikes and we get dropped 60 miles away and we come on the Mass Central Rail Trail all the way back and then we have a little celebration at the <laughs> Northampton Brewery. <laughs> <laughs> Another ride that we enjoy is we'll start at Farmington, Connecticut and we'll ride the rail trail from Farmington, Connecticut up to Northampton and then we have a little celebration at the Northampton Brewery. <laughs> you see a pattern. Uh, but this, uh, Paul stole the word I was going to use, but no offense, but he called it a gem. It is a gem, and everything we can do to support it, to expand it, is a really a positive thing for this community and the larger area. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Kevin Brace from Columbus Avenue. Brian, you run a great meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for, for your time. Um, there's been plenty said. I just want to say I support it. Um, I'm on the Transportation and Parking Commission, and for me, that's a way not to have cars. I mean, it, it's really, for me, transportation is can we find other ways to get around, and this is what we need. Um, I'm also on the Pedestrian and Bike Committee. Um, but really, George is the one who got me here for the Friends of Northampton Rails and Trails. So it takes all of those entities to try to make the network work because we are sort of working outside of what was the road system that we grew up with, and it's very important to us. And I just, I, I'm really tickled that we have a way to match the 200,000. That's important. So everything else has been said. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. <coughs> 
other folks to speak for the Birds Fog multi-use pad? Good evening, everyone. Uh, George Kohout. I live at 234 State Street down the road. I'm also the president of the Friends of the Northampton Trails in Greenwoods. We're a 200 member nonprofit organization that does a lot of activities in order to promote the use of the rail trail, not only here for Northampton residents, but as we've heard also region. It is a, it's a great, the, the trail system is an economic engine for the city. It's also a safe way to provide transportation for families, especially youth. It's, um, it's a place, a locus where we can have community events and, we, and we've uh, had quite a few where people really get to see each other. Um, it's also, you know, this project specifically, uh, this spur as we call it up in that portion of Florence, um, because we've more or less maxed out the existing rail trails, the, the old railroad lines, um, other than the one that perhaps goes out to Hatfield, we can't build things as easy as once was. So that's why the spur up here and the spur down the ice pond is really where we can expand um, the trail network. So the other thing the trail does is, and I think it's specific to here, is provides access to people who don't normally have access. As Councilor Labard said, it connects three neighborhoods up there. I think the fourth neighborhood that it really connects is Florence Heights. As many of you know, that's kind of an enclave in a most a positive and a negative way. And there's, if you're a young kid up there and you have a bike, you really can't ride anywhere except mm -hmm. around within those buildings. This will provide a place for those children, those families to use their bicycles, to walk. It'll allow them to access the conservation area too that perhaps wasn't open to them. Um, as I mentioned, I live down in near Stop and Shop. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, and at about 3 o'clock in the morning, the trail is full of kids going back and forth to the uh, grammar schools and to JFK. Kids from Meadowbrook, kids from Hampshire Heights that don't have folks who are dropping them off, but they go in pairs and groups. And, and it's a way for them to move safely back and forth from their homes to school. I think this is a great opportunity for us to provide that same safe access for those children. Um, so yeah, again, I can't uh, say enough about the, the hard choices ahead of you, um, but I think this project hits not only the recreational aspects of the Community Preservation Act, but also the open space aspects of the Community Preservation Act also. Um, and, it, and it continues uh, a gem, as we've heard in Northampton, that has so many impacts it's hard to enumerate. So, there must be something else. But I think that's plenty. Um, thank you very much for your consideration on this proposal. Anybody else for the Burt's Fog multi-use pad? Okay, why don't we take a quick two-minute stretch break and folks uh, who spoke to other proposals need to leave and do so. And two minutes to each of them.
I wanted to do the same thing. She was a teacher. Nobody ever told me that. I think it's a. Oh, I tried to. Yeah. So, I mean. Yeah. 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 We lived in Atlanta, so we we all Wow. <laughs> I wonder what they're charging for the affordable housing. Do they say anything about that? I think it depends on whether you have a voucher or for the for Section 8. Is it, is it yeah. rent or is it, are they selling? It's rent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the they have vouchers. And I don't think they're going to have to have a Section 8. <laughs> okay, we uh, but I think they're cheaper. We have three proposals that we did not hear from. Folks did not Jonathan sign up Wright to speak. Just uh, so let me just go over those. Just make sure no one's here to speak to the King Street Arms. In the public meeting, he's talking about the affordable housing in North Hampton is being 300,000. Or to the Park and Conservation so Accessibility. I'm mm. sorry, excuse me. I can't okay. stand here. Uh, so, so last up is the North Hampton Community Garden uh, Japanese Not Meat Invasive Removal Project. Uh, first on my list is Laird. Yes. Hi, I'm Larry Conker, and I live on Harrison Avenue in Northampton. I'm co-chair of the garden committee for the Northampton Community Garden. Um, for the couple of years that Betsy Wilson and I have been co-chairs, we have been aware of um, an area of Japanese knotweed that, is, that runs along the back road of the garden and in, has been beginning to encroach um, running underneath the road and coming into the garden. Um, we've worked to deal with it, both having gardeners cut it back just to keep it managed. This year, we worked with Bill Sullivan and the BPW to get bigger equipment up there to keep it cut back. Um, but we noticed more so that it was beginning to come up um, around and behind the largest compost pile that we have at the garden. So, a year ago, I don't think any of us even considered CPC grants or knew anything about them. Um, when we started looking at it, there were a couple of different projects that we looked at. One is a new tool shed, which we desperately need, but we prioritized the knotweed as being a larger threat to the garden if indeed it got into the compost or if it ran under the road and got into the garden. As we began to do research, um, the first proposal that came in that someone else on the committee researched was for the use of glyphosate. I volunteered to write the narrative for the grant, and as much as I saw that proposal, it was not one that I wanted to use. I'm a master gardener, trained as a horticulturist, and uh, actively teach pollinator habitat design classes and speak against using glyphosate or neonicotinoids or any chemicals um, many times a month. But doing the research, I've talked to almost every city planner, every conservation commission and committee and different groups, and based on the location and the, um, the topography of where the knotweed at the garden is, um, all the recommendations came back that, that we use legislate. And so that was, um, as we came up to the deadline for when the grant needed to be submitted, that was the, the recommendation that we made. We're aware that we kicked off a firestorm and that most of the people um, who are here tonight are um, speaking either negatively or, or positively about that. We're here as a committee because we still don't see another solution that would work. We're certainly open to hearing more and we've actively asked and have continued to talk with people. If we can, both sides, if their sides come together uh, on what a solution is, 
I think all of us are interested in protecting the gardens that we love so much. We understand that you have way more requests for dollars and for grants than you have money to give. Ours is relatively small in comparison at a little over $12,000 over five years. We hope that if we can all come together that we can um, refocus and that you will consider awarding a grant to us so that we can treat the knotweed and prevent it from coming into the garden. Thank you, Eric. Christy? Hi. Um, I'm a little nervous, so um, forgive me. Um, I'm uh, nervous because this is something I really care about. Um, I am a gardener at 266 Grove Street in Northampton, about a half mile from um, the community gardens. Um, and my name is Christy Peterson, if I say that. Um, <coughs> I uh, am a gardener at the gardens. I practice organic gardening. Um, I practice a particular method of soil management, um, no-till gardening, that um, is a very long-term strategy. It does not, uh, you, you, I'm planning for years in this garden. Um, this spring, I planted um, asparagus seeds um, from seed. I'm not even gonna harvest that stuff for three years. Um, I'm very invested in this. Um, my child and I walk to the gardens. Um, we, I, she plays in the, the paths while I garden. I was there almost every day this summer. Um, I wanna remind all of you, I'm sure you've all been to the gardens before. Um, we heard the words magic and gem tonight about other parts of our city and this is one of the magic gems of our city. Um, it is not just for the gardeners, although we as gardeners certainly benefit from the experience of gardening there. Um, it is a place that people come to walk. It is a place that people come to see beauty. It is a place that people come to observe things. Um, for me, I also enjoy doing, and I enjoy uh, gardening, and my family and I eat what we harvest from the garden. Um, and that is why I am here tonight to speak in favor of this grant and ask you to please give us the $12,000 to eradicate the Japanese knotweed. Um, it is a very real risk to the garden. Um, and I have read the proposal in its entirety. I feel that it's a well-researched, uh, considered, and uh, actually moderate but effective plan. Um, the people who put it together, nobody on the committee, um, and in full disclosure, I was invited to join the committee um, right before this all blew up. I had no part in this proposal. I'm coming to this as an outsider to the proposal, and if I did not believe in it, I would not be saying this. Um, but just in full disclosure, I'm probably going to be on the committee in the near future. Um, but this plan is uh, well researched. It's considered and it's an effective plan to address a very real threat to um, the entire garden, which as I said is a gem and a treasure to this city. Um, nobody on the committee is pro-Roundup, and I've heard people saying that, that so and so is, they're pro-Roundup. Nobody is pro-Roundup. Um, glyphosate is a tool, and as you know, it is an effective tool for this threat. Um, Larry, I believe, has sent you some of the research that she has done extensively into this issue, um, and uh, I'm not going to rehash it for you here because I would rather that you read it yourself than you hear my half-baked reinterpretation of it off the top. Um, and also, we've got a lot of people connected. Um, delay is not going to change the need, the need to eradicate the knotweed nor is it going to change the best way to do it. It will only increase the size of the infestation, bringing it ever closer to the actual garden itself. Um, for that reason, I'm asking you please to approve this grant tonight and allow us to start to address it next summer. Um, if you uh, do garden or maybe you just try to knock back the uh, ropes in your own yard, you know stuff grows fast here. Um, and one season means a lot of growth of this plot. Um, 
So I hope you can make what you know is the right decision in the face of controversy about this and let us take care of the problem. Thank you very much for your time and for your consideration. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, Betsy? I'll pass. Uh, Ellie? Hi, everybody. I'm Ellie Cook, and I've been a gardener at Community Garden since 1988. Maybe it was 87. And I love the garden. I happen to be, in self-interest, directly across the street from the Mountain Leaf. And I don't think that there's really any way to protect the people opposite the knotweed from the spraying that will happen. There'll be injection of glyphosate, glyphosate and also spraying. And I just don't think it's possible to be protected. And I don't really want to wait and see if my milkweed dies. Um, will they put up a curtain? What are they going to do? And in the interest of us all, there's far too much uncertainty about the short and long-term effects of this substance. Spraying and injecting where it likely will affect wildlife, other plants, dogs, who, there's a dog walking area all around there. Dogs are highly allergic to, I don't have a dog by the way, in the interest of full disclosure, but a lot of people do and they walk their dogs there. Dogs get sick from it very easily. and. The effects on amphibians are pretty well known, and there's a downhill from the, from the area where they will work if they work, downhill into a stream, and down there are the keepers. And it's just, you know, it's crazy to be putting this stuff into that area. And with all the positives that I see online about this substance, they seem to come from the former maker, Monsanto, which is now Bayer, because Monsanto was too controversial for Bayer to use their name. <laughs> so I think, you know, there's something going on here that I don't want to see happening in the community gardens, which, as people have said, are a gem of Northampton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, Jana, I believe. Did I say that right? Jana. Jana. Okay, I'm in your um, It's been really a treat to be here. I wasn't really looking forward to coming because this is so controversial, but just hearing about all the work you do and um, doing the owl who and hearing about this our wonderful community has been really a treat. So I want to thank you all for your work and I want to thank the Northampton Community Garden Committee for their work too. I am opposed to bringing a bunch of poison up to the community gardens for five years to spray it um, over a large area for a number of reasons. But um, I've tried to talk to people on the committee who strongly support it and ask good questions and try to find out where they're coming from and how we can come together and, and sell this peacefully. And I just keep being told that there's no other way and I, I will stop to think tonight we went to the moon, we built subways, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I just think we can do it. <laughs> we don't have to bring gallons and gallons of poison up there for five years to get rid of any plant. We can get rid of, we're human beings, we can get rid of trees easily. If this is a, these are a small plant. I used to hand dig Japanese knotweed, knotweed when I lived in the hill towns and um, people, you know, didn't think I could do it, but <laughs> that was a little tough, but we can, we can do this. And Marty Dagoberto um, of the Northeast Organic Farmers Association has said that there are alternate methods. I'm sorry that this controversy came to you, um, and I'm sorry for the committee that, you know, it's an awkward situation and timing to try to sell this, but I don't believe that the proposal represents the will of the majority of gardeners. And I think that's a really important point. And I also think that the proposal represents a liability for the garden and for the city um, for various reasons. Um, and I, I think that's an important point too. So um, I, it's, it's going to be fine to um, you know, pass this grant proposal. I've asked people on the committee to just withdraw the request for funds and take time to find out 
you know, how to do it without poison, um, and, you know, restore the peace and get rid of the not -weed. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Steve? Okay. Uh, Bernadette? Good evening. My name is Bernadette Giblin. I live on 110 William Street in North Hampton. And like so many other folks who've spoken tonight, what a treat it is to behold the work that you do. And I want to thank you ever so much because um, I know it's a tremendous amount of um, community service that you're engaged in. Um, the work, I've lived in Northampton for 32 years. And I have been a NOFA, Northeast Organic Farmer Association, accredited organic land care professional for 13 years. Um, I take an oath <laughs> to hold, nobody puts our hands on Bibles when we go to the gathering. Uh, I'm wondering what the Bible would look like for no, but anyway. Um, but I do adhere to the precautionary principle um, which the environmentalist movement is based on, which is to do no harm. Um, and to look for non-toxic alternatives um, as, at, at all costs. I have a statement here um, just about the use of um, the word invasive um, to describe plants like they're invaders, when in fact we're applying principles to human behaviors to plants who are really just opportunists in um, soil conditions which are damaged. I am not going to read it, and in fact, I would actually like to ask the committee if I can defer my time to my colleague, Mike Bald, who has kindly come here from Vermont. He, in fact, is a um, expert in um, non-toxic organic methods to remove Japanese not weed. Would that be okay? Oh, certainly. Thank you. Good evening and thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting and, and uh, to be here and I, I think this is a brilliant opportunity. I, I like if you run a, a great meeting. I'm uh, I'm interested to hear what people have to say <clears throat> and um, I like the decision process that you go through. Let me just take a drink and I'll start. <clears throat> My name is Mike Bald, <clears throat> Royalton, Vermont. Uh, owner, founder. <clears throat> quality control coordinator, creative uh, artist, everything to do with Got Weeds, uh, non-chemical invasive species management company since 2010. I work from the New York side of Lake Champlain to Cape Cod. I presented in Ireland, Michigan, Massachusetts, Maryland. Um, I'm not here to present my qualifications. I'm not here to look for work. I'm not here to critique anybody else's work or anybody's concepts. I've heard some interesting ideas um, and concerns already tonight. Um, I always like to give credit to Massachusetts, the great state of Massachusetts, for inspiring me to start Got Weeds back in 2008, 2009. I used to come to Northampton, listen to John Kempf and Biomutrient folks speak and have their conferences, and I kept driving back to Vermont saying, why don't we have organically acceptable I don't claim the word organic, I claim to be organically acceptable. Why don't we have this in Vermont? And then I decided, well, even though people have been telling me since 2004, it can't be done. That's already been pointed out tonight. It can't be done, we can't stop parsnip, chervil, galweed, Japanese knotweed, can't do it. It's gotta be sprayed. Okay, I'm gonna find out. I've been in the military, been to school, ex-combat engineer. When do you call the combat engineers? in the army. You call them when, when everything's upside down and on fire and nobody can figure out what to do. You call in the combat engineers. We show up, get it done. Simple. Um, <clears throat> invasive species, I guess I'll explain it this way. My job is to make things disappear. But again, combat engineer experience. I showed up in Germany in 1989. Eight months later, no more Berlin Wall. Done. But that's what I do. And it's critical to point out here that 
My work is not is not a reflection of me. I do, as you know now, invasive species management, long term, not non chemical. I don't do poison ivy. I don't do native plants. I, and I don't do single species at a time. The big theme at the conference this year in Ireland was let's let's look larger. Let's get the integrated approach here, folks, and stop operating in silos. Well, I always give credit to the people that hire me because it's not me that's it's not me making a difference. So the South Burlingtons, the Randolph Vermonts, the King Arthur Flowers, they're not looking for grants, they're not looking for coin, they are hiring me because they want an alternative to putting toxins in any situation that will drain into Lake Champlain, the Connecticut River, and so forth. I give, I, give, I give credit to Massachusetts for the inspiration, and I give credit to all those who ask me to speak or hire me because <clears throat> I embrace that mindset and their willingness to explore. Um, I understand you're not going to ask questions tonight. Um, I was prepared. I'm, I don't advertise myself as an expert. I feel I have much to learn. I always do. Knotweed was discussed in Ireland at, at the September conference. I learned a little bit. Um, frankly, goldenrod was the dominant concept at the, at the conference. But um, I'll try to cover a few things, and you keep me on track. And I'll, I'm certainly welcome to your questions. But I'll try to give you the information I have. I have with me here. First, I did hand off a, a, I did come through this weekend, have a look at the site and say, this is what I see, this is what I would do here. I have some grasp of your vision for the space. I think it's a fantastic space, community gardens. But there's three things that drive the management approach. There's the plant species, the targeted species, plural. There's the site conditions, what the site will allow or not allow. And then there's the vision of the landowners and adjacent, adjoining, impacted, affected. So it's got to be vision, the plant species, and the site itself. I, to me, the, I don't have clarity on the vision entirely. I'm, I was a little confused, or it wasn't totally clear to me how the grant was written up, how the other proposal was written up. I do think the space is worth, it is, is valuable. The community garden space combined with the Depending on what you read, this is where my confusion comes from. It's either wetlands below, farmland below, or woodland below, downslope of the community gardens. I don't know why there's confusion, but... It's all three. There you go. It's probably all three, depending on where the boundary lines are. I think we know that Japanese knotweed doesn't care where the boundaries are, where the boundary lines are. I typically try to invite everyone to uh, work around boundaries. Um, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> So I do think the, the space is worth, I don't like military terminology, I don't like battle terminology, I'm not gonna use the word defending. I think the space and the people that work and thrive there, the space is worth stewarding. I'm sure there are beekeepers somewhere nearby, and I, you should know that the FDA is now finding glyphosate in the majority of honey samples. There is no acceptable limit, limit for, um, for glyphosate in honey, so it's like, now what do we do? Um, so while the space is valuable and priceless and it's a, it's a gem in the community, that to me drives, well then why would you come in with a, with a chemical option as you're, it, you can't have both. You can't take this space and treat it with chemicals and say that it's still special. Mm -hmm. Although you, you, you try to add up that math, it doesn't add up for me. So I did. I did submit uh, my thoughts and as best I could without having a formal request for proposals or without having a vision clear in my head. Mm -hmm. I put in a little summary of my thoughts, my approach. Um, I reached out. I reach out to academics all the time. I hear back from a small percentage of them. I reached out to the federal government here in Mass. I heard nothing back from the Fed. I have not heard much from the Fed in the last in the last eight years, to be honest. They know that I would say that. Um, I reached out to Christian Marks. I believe if you've done your research here in your exploration of this project, you would have reached out uh, to Christian because he's right down the street. Um, I actually now feel like my proposal needs modification because even though it was just prepared in the last couple of days, Christian said to me, Mike, there's, a, there's really no argument for doing control of Japanese knotweed along the Mill River in general because it is one of five watersheds that are lined up. They're in the pipeline for biocontrol of knotweed, whenever that happens. But his impression was that that's coming. 
So it's like, okay, I get it, Christian. I'm glad we talked. You're an, you're another professional. That's what I do. Pull the pull the information together, boil it down, and see what comes out. So that was interesting. I I'm glad you responded. Thank you for that. Um, That's Christian marks of the nature conservancy. Right down the road. Um, thank you. So I don't want to take too long. I want to I want to be simple. I did uh, I did hand a proposal to some of your uh, your community members. Uh, I will say that I looked at the articles in support of the approach. There was one, uh, a scientific article, and they talk about 99% control, 98% control. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. It's a single, it, it tends to be, Japanese knotweed tends to be like one or two interconnected, interwoven, underground rhizomal organisms. I mean, it's, it's, it's essentially a clone. So if you kill one thing 99% of the way, it's a, new, it's, it's a number that doesn't make sense. Either kill it or you don't. I live right next to the railroad tracks in Royalton, Vermont. They spray it every couple years with soil sterilant. 200 feet of Japanese knotweed was sprayed in June of 2016 with soil sterilant. It was back at about 10% of its former space by September of that year. I've looked up soil sterilant. That's powerful stuff. If it can survive soil sterilant, and road shoulders are tricky spaces to work. I'll leave you with that thought. Um, I would like to, I guess I would close by saying, uh, were I to work the space, were I to take it on, uh, I would invite partnerships, I would invite the community to train alongside. My first thing I do is I safe the site. I have no, no wish to ever be injured, so overhead hazards, eliminated, reduced. Safe the site, train people <clears throat> alongside me for while I'm there. I can be there 10 times a year, I can be there three times a year. People can learn from me and then they can carry the knowledge forward. They can do the work. That was the conversation in New York last month. What do we need to do? Do you guys need me? Okay, call me in an emergency. I have an 82 year old client in uh, Thetford, Vermont. Who, she did nine not weed cuts and she finally called me in July. I said, Mike, you gotta get out here. I've done what you told me to do. I can't do the 10th cut. Get on out here. And I'll tell you what, Hazel was on, on the mark with quality control. She did good work. Um, so I told you I will save the site. I I'm welcome, I'm, would welcome community members to train alongside and learn and carry whatever stewardship is going to happen at the community gardens. Carry it forward in time. It's not supposed to end. Stewardship is ongoing. There is no clean site. There is no ideal condition in nature. Dynamic is the word you need to keep in mind. You've got bittersweet, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, Japanese barberry at that site. You've got a uh, spindle tree. I've never seen that yuan in this bush before, climbing 40 feet up into the trees. Bittersweet is the overhead hazard. You've got a lot, a big collection of issues there. They need to be, they should be addressed collectively. And if you train people from year one and year two, oriental bittersweet will never get established there again. Uh, lastly, I will say that people would uh, will have connection and, uh, and ownership of the site, more so than I'll ever have. So I think that local ownership's a big deal. In the end, I think it's a, it's a town decision. It's what do you want to stand for? I saw that people have made that comment. You know, we don't want this done in our name, or we do want it done for whatever reasons. I agree with that. The people that I work for, I brought it with me. I brought an article that appeared, that the Forest Service interviewed me. I, I just I, I closed out the article. I was actually surprised it got past their censors because I used to work for the Forest Service. I said to to the in the interview process, I said the people that hire me are basically embracing what Aldo Leopold said years ago. Every action on the landscape, with every stroke of the axe, you leave your signature on the land. Whatever you do, whatever you don't do, your presence, your absence. That's what you stand for, That's, that defines you. And people that hire me, or the people that hire goats, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the approach is, hire chemical, hire non-chemical, that defines your, that defines how you, how you steward your land. My, personally, my clients prefer that their signature on the land be etched in sweat rather than in synthetic toxins. Um, I do welcome your questions, but I understand that's not part of the process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the time. I probably spoke too long. Uh, next up is Arlene. Hi, uh, I'm Arlene Vakian. I live at 33 Old Drive in Northampton. 
And I am a member of the Garden Committee. This is my first year on the Garden Committee. I um, have had applied to the Garden for a while. Um, I'm just amazed that the former speaker was presenting himself as somebody to make a proposal to work on this plot, and he doesn't even, he, he doesn't know it. He hasn't been here, and I don't know why he's applying for a job. That's it. Um, I didn't know anything about Japanese that way until I got on the garden committee. And to me, it's like a horror show. It, it's, it's a plant that should be in a horror show. And in the UK, and they brought it in, um, if you're going to sell your house, you have to certify that it doesn't have nothing on it. And if it does, the price of the house comes down. And if you plant not wheat, you can go to prison. Oh. And uh, in Wales, it took over a whole town. So this is not bittersweet. This isn't um, morning glory. This isn't a pesky meaning. So if we want to preserve the garden, we have to deal with the knockweed. And, you know, I really trust the work that Larry has done. She's uh, very knowledgeable, and she worked really hard and talked to people, conservationists, who advised her that this was the best way to do it. Um, and I guess I feel, um, well, I'll just stop there. I love the garden. I spend a lot of time there. I have four plots. I kill myself up there. Um, and I was up there the other day, and I was afraid to take compost because of the knotweed. I was afraid that I would bring the knotweed into the garden. And I think we're at that stage. And I really agree that if we wait, um, we're going to be faced with a situation that's going to be even worse. Thanks. Thank you, Arlene. Lily? Um, this is just finished my sixth season of the, of the garden, and when I first came on, I wasn't a very good gardener. Um, I'd like to think that I'm a little bit better now, and I have enjoyed being there. Um, but I just found out about this about 10 days ago, and I'm surprised because we are a community garden, yet this hasn't been part of our community process. I didn't know anything about it. I actually have a garden space that's right near where they want to do this. And I am very, very opposed to it. I am so worried about some chemical making me sick. That I will not stay at this garden if they go ahead and do it. I feel passionately about that. My health is more important. No weed will make anyone sick. We don't know enough. We're not using the word roundup. We've all heard about that. People are getting sick and they die from it. We don't know enough about it. They will spray. They talk about the, the weed that might actually get into the garden. You know what? We have lots of weeds in the garden. We, we have cleanup at the end of the year. We're constantly working on it. They don't make us sick. We, they talk about using, I, I have done, I've had community service jobs, including this past summer, where I'm knee deep in the compost pile, which is where this whole area is, and digging out weeds. That could make someone sick. We talk about the weed, not weed, getting into the compost pile, what about this poison getting into the compost pile? And then taking that poison to our garden. I am so much more worried about that than I'd ever be about a weed. This past year, and I have other times, there's a lovely young woman that came in with her little baby. And she sat her baby down and she played in the soil. Now I want you to think about that. I want you to think, what if that was my baby 
or my grandchild playing in that soil? Are you confident? Are you 100% confident that it would be safe? Because I'm not. I don't know enough to know. I don't know. We don't know. You heard the word Monsanto used. That's right. A lot of companies want to tell us all the great things. They do great things. But they haven't always done great things. People have gone sick. People have died from this. We need to be very, very careful. I like planting garlic every year. I've been planting the garlic that was given to me when I first started there by a lovely gardener who's no longer with us. Stayed there, I think, until about 90. And every year I plant that garlic. I use the, the, the seeds from the previous year and I keep planting. I keep thinking of him. I have not planted garlic this year. I will not plant my garlic this year. It's ready. I'm ready to do it. But I will not do it if this goes through. Thank you. Thank you, Adele. Uh, Catherine? <coughs> Hi, um, Catherine Stout. I've gardened at the Northampton Community Garden for 34 years, since 1984. And I am vehemently opposed to this um, proposal. I have written here, and this is just the beginning, um, four pages. It's going to take, it would take me 16 minutes to read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's okay with you or not. I think we'd love an abbreviated version. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can give you, I can you, can, give you can, all copies because I have That would be copies. great. If you yeah. give us copies and. You can, you can read it at your I don't mean to be disrespectful. That's fine. Um, I just, that's why I asked. I didn't want to go on too long. Um, Try to summarize. Um, okay, the garden. Most of the gardeners heard about this thing October 27th from an email that Larry sent out, and she said that there would be no spraying. And if you look at the proposal on the website, it says there will be spraying, um, and that says there are two targeted methods, so-called targeted methods described that the proposal does not commit land stewardship to using them. Um, that the proposal carried out would mean spray drift into the community garden, the surrounding neighborhoods, the wild land, wetlands, agricultural land planning, and dog walking trails, but it gets worse. Because it doesn't matter how you apply it, glyphosate doesn't stay in the plant. It spreads into the root system, as Larry said, but it does not stop there. It is exuded through the roots into the soil. Some of it degrades into a chemical called AMPA, amino methylphosphonic acid, which some scientists say is more toxic than glyphosate itself. Dr. Don Huber, who studied glyphosate for decades at Purdue University, said the carbon phosphide bond, which creates the synthetic glyphosate molecule, requires an enzyme to break it, which is rare in nature. And that means glyphosate is not biodegradable. It persists in the soil for decades. In some studies, it has been found 22 years later. What is glyphosate? How does it work? Um, it was originally patented to clean steam boilers. It's a chelator, all positively charged elements. Calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, cobalt, molybdenum, silicon, chromium, and more. All of them are essential nutrients for plants and animals and us. When you apply glyphosate to a plant, it's like giving it AIDS. And if plants treated, plants treated in, uh, okay, it's like, Giving the plant AIDS, it also has a similar effect on human beings. It attacks the human immune system. It kills microbes in our gut. It causes an immune cancer called non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's a land a groundskeeper in California who just recently, in August, won a $289 million lawsuit against Monsanto for causing his cancer. And not only causing his cancer, but for lying about this. They've known that it causes cancer since 1985. So, but we're also, we're talking about long-term soil damage, destroying beneficial microbes, multiplying harmful ones. Soil loses its texture, becomes subject to erosion. And one scientist says, oh, it kills, kills mycorrhizae, which are essential for trees. 
And a scientist says that, how can you tell when a tree has no mycorrhizae? It's dead. There's a good reason to suspect that glyphosate applied to that hillside next to the community garden will kill trees on that hillside. California, Florida, and Texas are experiencing massive die-off of citrus trees due to so-called citrus greening disease, which is caused by spraying glyphosate on the ground. And if you understand how glyphosate works, you realize it is impossible to precisely target it. It alters the soil. The more you use it, such that all planted trees growing in that soil become susceptible to disease and eventually death. The amount of glyphosate to be used on that hillside is not small. It calls for eight applications over five years and then spot treatment thereafter. Even then, they don't guarantee complete eradication. They say 90 to 90 percent, more or less. Andrew Whiteley gave a percep uh, presentation on the evolution of resistance to pesticides as part of the Master Gardeners lecture series. He's an evolutionary biologist. He works at UMass. Um, he said in his presentation that a 90 percent effectiveness rate means that 10 percent of the population is resistant, or here it might be 1 percent. But what, you know, the Proposal says that what is left will have a bonsai appearance. That means we stunt it, I suppose, the root damage disease because it is growing in a sick soil. Andrew White said the 10% that is resistant to pesticide eventually produces an entire resistant population. He showed us pictures of Roundup resistant superweeds, such as the Palmer amaranth, which can stop a tractor taking up entire farm fields. We will have some glyphosate resistant knotweed after the end of five years that will require some other form of control to keep it in check perhaps 2,4-D, Paraquat, some other herbicide, or gardener volunteers willing and able to climb down a steep hillside of shifting sand soil carrying sharp tools. And, but it gets worse, because the U.S. Geological Survey has discovered that glyphosate and AMPA move via water, ditches, drains, drains streams, and rivers, common in surface waters, found widely in the environment wherever glyphosate is used. The location where it grows is on a steep hillside, where the knotweed grows, the soil type is a complete loamy sand, topsoil, 70 to 85 percent sand, subsoil, coarse sand, and gravel. The drainage is extremely fast. The bottom of the hillside is a stream. The stream flows all along the bottom of the hillside through the agricultural land dog park area to the Mill River and winds up in the Connecticut. The glyphosate applied to that hillside will not stay on that hillside. Some of it breaks down into AMPA, possibly more toxic, moves on rainwater through that soil into the stream, eventually to the rivers. That stream is habitat for peeper frogs. Anybody who's been in the garden or in the Sunrise area in the spring has heard the peeper frogs. We have um, chicken and frog embryos subjected to heavily diluted Roundup, show serious malformations and or die. Injections of a very low dose of glyphosate into frog and chicken embryos cause spinal defects. Glyphosate changes levels of retinoic acid, considered fundamental for protecting the body from cancer and for helping embryonic cells develop properly. Um, Rachel Carson wrote a book, Silent Spring, published in 1963. I read it a long time ago, but I remember her warnings about pesticides, especially DDT at the time, moving through the food chain all the way, th that trying to kill bugs with DDT had the unintended consequence of killing birds. There is no way to apply toxic chemicals to a natural system and neatly contain them. They move in the interconnected ways of natural systems. Glyphosate and that hillside has the ability to spread through water along the stream all the way to the Mill River, turning that stream into a stream of death and destruction the whole way. Dead hillside, dead soil, dead trees, dead frogs, dead birds. Dog walkers don't let your dog drink that water play in it either. Five years of repeated applications of glyphosate to an area on that hillside, 40 or 100 feet or greater, 40 times 100 feet or greater. This is not a small, discreet, carefully controlled application of glyphosate. There's no way to possibly confine its effects to the targeted knotweed. They, they also claim that you know, they're going to use heavy equipment on that soil. I don't think it's how difficult to walk down that hill without the soil moving. I don't understand how they can use heavy equipment and spend three years killing everything on that hillside without and only seed it in year three and then not have erosion. And if you have erosion, which exposes the subsoil, which is coarse sand and gravel, what grows on that? Not much. The proposal also says that the back road is gravel. It's actually paved. And that's an important piece of information because 20 feet of pavement along the entire length separates the knotweed from the garden. It forms an effective barrier to the spread of knotweed. I have walked that every day when I'm at the garden, and I have never seen knotweed 
not be across the road. And I don't think anyone else has either. I don't know where that's coming from, saying that it has, because I have, I know that property and it's been there. And I find particularly absurd the argument that this mass spraying and otherwise application of glyphosate herbicide is needed to protect the communal compost pile. See the effects of glyphosate on soil above. Spreading glyphosate laced compost on the garden would do far more harm than the potential invasion of the pile by Japanese knotweed. I trust that gardeners who saw knotweed growing in the compost wouldn't take it and put it on their gardens, but glyphosate in the compost would be invisible and the harm that it would cause. There's always the option of moving the communal compost pile. Um, I'm not writing about the human health effects of glyphosate because they make me cry. I attended an entire day with Dr. Don Huber last year, 2017, at the NOFA conference. Um, since since um, the introduction of Roundup Ready GM, GMOs um, in 1996, there's been a skyrocketing use of Roundup, and the human population in the United States has also had a skyrocketing rate of and numerous diseases. He said 391, including autism, Alzheimer's. It's a very long list. Um, it's a carcinogen. World Health Organization has called it a carcinogen. It's, um, it's known to cause genetic mutations. Um, it's an endocrine disruptor. Um, it harms uh, development, creates birth defects. He showed us pictures of um, cows that had chronic botulism. They died in two years and were lying down in their stalls. This stuff is very toxic. And anyone who doesn't believe that, and believes that it's safe because Monsanto says so, should consider the fact that Monsanto has also brought us PCBs, DDT, uh, dioxin, Agent Orange, a whole entire list of now banned products, um, toxic products. Larry Coffey, she claims in her email of the gardeners of October 27th that many gardeners at the community garden use toxic pesticides in their garden. That is not my experience. She claims there's a lot of support in the garden among the gardeners for this proposal. Again, I don't think so. I believe this committee to put forth a proposal like this is seriously out of touch with the gardeners. Larry has said to me, that this community garden can't be a democracy. Uh -huh. And I personally was kept, I wanted to be on the committee. I was told I could not be on the committee. And I was targeted with a very unfair inspection that threatened to take away my garden this last past year. And I have been to garden committee meetings where they talked about you know, getting rid of bad gardener, all kinds of crazy stuff. It's like, there are many people who garden who use the phrase garden Nazis. Um, you know, to refer to the, you know, it, the dictatorship that, you know, keeps people in fear of speaking up. I have been, I have gotten, a, had, I got an email from the former garden committee chair telling me not to even talk to my immediate neighbors about pesticides. And I can give people copies of that email if they want to see it. It's, um, you know, we have, yeah, I believe that this garden has to be a democracy or we're seriously in danger of not having enough gardeners to keep it going. Many gardeners have left in the past few years to join the Florence Organic Community Garden. That garden has a lengthy waiting list. We have empty plots. We had 60 new gardeners this March. By mid-July, we had 35 abandoned plots. Many gardeners feel that this committee does not hear them and does not represent them. I believe that if this proposal goes forward, this community garden will lose many more gardeners. I believe that if we had an elected garden committee, we would not be talking about using glyphosate to eradicate knotweed. I don't believe that a majority of the community gardeners support this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Anybody else to speak for the community garden basic project? Yes, I would, but I haven't signed up. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Peggy Best. I live on 14 Fleet Street, East Northampton. And so much has been said. I want to start by saying thank you for being here. 
I had no idea the, the issues involved in all of the proposals. So it's been a really good experience. Um, my, I have something that I'd like to just put into the record. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, I had an extraordinary experience working with Cedar Chavez and the United Farm Workers in Southern California. And actually, I was in charge of New Jersey with regards to the, the Great Boycott. And I was involved in the first study of the use of pesticides in the agricultural fields of California. And out of that awareness, out of that uh, study, or the work we did among farm workers, originated that organic movement. Because it, before that time, there was not a relationship between the diseases or the issues that occurred within farm workers and the pesticides used in the fields. And in 1971, I had the extraordinary experience of being part of the first organic farm in Washington State uh, within the farm worker movement. And I know from experience and the studies we did, I can't comprehend why we, in Northampton, in, in a place where I was told 12 years ago, I think approximately 12 years ago, that it was an organic farm or an organic garden. Because I wouldn't be part of it if I had known this. And I think the big issue for me, or another variable, is that I think on the proposal it says May 5th. And yet I didn't hear about it until October. And I think the way that garden, it's a community, and I think in this important issue, the community should have been notified in the summer when there were people I'm amazed at the work that some of these people have done to get a group here when there's nobody at the garden in October, which is when I found out. And I just want to leave this one vignette. yet. I have a grandson who grew up in Northampton, and he's now 20 in school in Boston. And when he was six and seven, he would walk up to the community garden through Smith College and up through the, the trail up there. And at six, he said to me, I feel very depressed about the situation in the world. But when I come to the garden, I have hope. And I know that in the shutter, if I had known that there were pesticides used in that garden, I would not have brought him up. Because he'd take his shoes off and you'd wander around the safe area, sit down and read. And I just think that's what we want in that garden. Now there's a whole community evolved around, you know, involved within this space. Pregnant women, and I've spoken to a couple of them, were shocked that this was going on. And I think we have to be aware that there are homes and families. It's just not an isolated area like it was when I first started. So again, I just want to thank you for educating me since 710 that what is going on in this community, I have no idea. And that I would prefer the $13,000 to go to all these other, divide it up between the other groups. Because that's what Northampton is about, and that's why I think that this is not a proposal that I would ever support. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Oh, here. I actually signed up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking. I, I, I'm not saying that you're taking my space, but uh, but I don't know what happened to your list. Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm That's okay. Tell us um, uh, your name again. I don't know. So, um, so I don't. Uh, the reason I'm saying this because I don't know. If you skipped a whole bunch of names. No, I don't think so. I think just you would tell us. Oh, I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't take me. My apologies. Uh, I guess I'm special. Um, I find this situation to be uh, really very disturbing, very tragic in so many ways. Um, and I'm uh, not a fan of glyphosate. 
And I, uh, you know, we live in a sea of chemicals nowadays. People spray all kinds of things all over the place. Uh, I have spoken against, um, at, at our Northampton Board of Health, I have spoken against the use of herbicides and pesticides on uh, our public lands, and especially around schools. But it is, in fact, done here in Northampton, and I think it's terrible. Um, I, I think that, you know, glyphosate is, is used indiscriminately and for ridiculous reasons in home gardens, in, in vegetable gardens, in farms that are, you know, miles and miles and miles wide. So, um, so we're living in a really toxic world that's kind of crazy. Um, but we also have these very difficult problems that we have to deal with, and one of them is Japanese knotweed, which doesn't belong here, uh, which is notoriously difficult to get rid of, and can in fact destroy whole communities. Now, I used to live in the South, so I know all about um, um, kudzu. 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 Thank you, kudzu. So, you know, I, I, I've seen what that does, but that's a very different, that's a different plant and a different issue, but it certainly destroys forests, and it certainly destroys people's um, gardens. Uh, in any case, I don't have personal experience with knotweed, but I know for, that um, it is known to be an intractable plant that can, in fact, destroy gardens, forests, um, you name it. And um, so I personally, although I am totally opposed in general to the use of pesticides and herbicides, see this as a really reasonable thing to do in a controlled and very specific way to address uh, this particular problem in this location in order to protect the garden. I mean, that's the whole point of this. If people didn't care about preserving the garden, then you wouldn't care about the not, not getting uh, taking over the place. So um, I have to rely on people who I trust who know a lot more than I do about these sorts of controlled applications who say that, in fact, this is a very reasonable and responsible uh, use of glyphosate. It's unfortunate that there, um, that there are no good alternatives. And so I just wanted to say that I uh, think that the Garden Committee has done an admirable job of seeking out good advice and a uh, reputable contractor who, who does this and has a very good reputation for uh, these kinds of controlled uh, applications. And I think it's very, very unfortunate that, and I'm sure that the Garden Committee, or I'm guessing that the Garden Committee has learned a lot from this experience um, about the importance of involving the whole gardening community before they uh, take on such a task in the future. Um, but here we are, folks, and um, I just wanted to say that even those of us who are opposed to the use of these chemicals can see that there are good reasons to use them in very controlled ways. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Please. I'm not sure. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, you want to list? Go ahead. Oh, we're done with the list, they're just moving up. Okay. Yeah, some of us are losing our blood sugar here. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, do you want to uh, go ahead? Well, wait, she's going first. Okay, okay I look yeah, really I'm bad at public I'm speaking, so you're going to have to excuse me. Um, but I feel very passionate and committed to this issue. I'm going to try to channel um, Professor Coyne right name now, it. who's my old speech professor. Just your name, your name. My name is Anne, I'm a Northampton uh, resident, and I'm also cute. I'm not going to do this speech. Um, so, um, I don't even know where to begin. I feel very impacted by this. And my, my recommendation tonight is to ask this committee to reject this rant. Lots of people have spoke. This is a toxin. This is a carcinogenic substance. This is about eight car lengths from my plot. And might I mention, this was never, I was never informed. I was never asked for any input. Does anyone know the definition of community? It's in the actual title. It's called a Northampton Community Garden. What is this community?
anybody doing excluding the gardeners from something so poisonous, toxic, carcinogenic? I'm also a cancer survivor, so I'm very impacted by this on many levels. And I can't stress to you, you have received to date 51 letters. 51 letters. You've also heard a lot of public comments today. There's a lot of opposition to this grant. I can't imagine it's going to pass. You have to include not only the gardeners, but the community. Many, this is city property. Many community members walk through there. Children, teenagers, dogs. There's a lot of water. We, talk, we, saw, we talked about owls tonight. And I want you to know that it was very, I, it was a magical moment here when everybody started making owl noises. I, thought, I felt a lot of hope. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I saw an owl on the side of the road at the garden and it spooked and it went right down through the knotweed and down through. Magic. Every summer, the frogs come up from the wetland, take up residency in my plot. I'm an organic gardener. Those frogs are beautiful, but they're beneficial. They help keep the beetle population down. And they're amazing. I could go on and on about the magic at the gardens. I've been there for years. That is a special place for me. And when the world feels like it's falling apart, a lot of us, we go to that garden. It is beautiful. Have you been? I encourage you to go. It's public. Walk through there. It is a gorgeous, beautiful, magical, peaceful place. There is no place for toxins at the community garden. We have tonight, last night, I talked to Mike Bald at length because we haven't had much time to research and develop a non-toxic solution, as you know. But they exist. You just heard from someone tonight. This is what he does for a living. He's done, he, this is somebody who has said to you, <coughs> non-toxic, not weed solutions exist. And this community, garden, deserves that. This city deserves that. We don't need to poison this garden. Eight car lengths, that's close. That's my plot. I just planted 150 garlic. I understand your point about garlic. Mm -hmm. I feel like I can't harvest my garlic next year if this goes through. This proposal involves spraying. Don't be fooled when it says precise injections. Read on further. The proposal specifically states ladders, backpack sprayers. Do you know what that involves? Are you qualified to even examine that? I'm not a not weed expert. And I'm also not a glyphosate expert. But it doesn't <coughs> take much to look up glyphosate. <coughs> In those letters sent to your committee, people have referenced how toxic. A letter came in tonight. I was CC'd on. I hope that you will review it. It is a previous committee member. And her letter was strong. Those letters can't be ignored. These voices tonight can't be ignored. And I am grateful that I just by luck found out about this. I'm a gardener. And I just happened to be there on a Saturday in shorts, the last day of the year, a couple Saturdays ago, that's not long ago, and somebody came up to me and knows I'm a great organic gardener and said, do you know what's going on? And I looked at her and I said, is this in, I, I was so shocked, I said, is this in writing? I need to see this in writing because I don't believe it. And I looked at the documents and I saw that it was real. And I emailed my garden committee to verify it was real. And it was. And that's how this conversation began. And that is how transparency was established. And that is how this campaign for awareness. And to bring a community together, because we're a community, right? It says it in the title. So why aren't we functioning in that way? And we, we know there's a non-toxic solution to this issue. Why aren't we exploring it? Why are people just going forward? So I'm asking this committee to reject this proposal. It's unnecessary. We do not have to poison the magic of this beautiful garden. There is another way. 
and we should explore. <coughs> and I would like to give a few more minutes to clarify my fall that he did visit this site on November 3rd. He did examine the knotweed. This is what he does for work. He works with this specific plant. This is what he does. And he has committed in writing that there is a non-chemical solution to knotweed. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? Eight car lengths from my garden. Please reject this proposal and allow this community to come together and explore this non-toxic. Let's think about the owls. Let's think about the wildlife. Let's think about the Mill River. Let's think about the impacts, not just on the humans, the wildlife, the environment. We have another option, and we must explore it. There's no rush here. There's no rush here. It's not we have been here for a long time. It has not got into the garden. That's right. We can move that compost. There's something called an asphalt road. Do you know what that is? It's a death barrier. Not we can't cross it. <clears throat> you must reject this proposal and allow this community to heal and come together to deal with not we in a non-toxic method that does exist. And that's why we're here tonight. And I'm very thankful for this time. And I almost, sitting there earlier, I said to myself, I might just as a joy come to your meeting sometimes because I learned so much about what's going on. Wherever that preserve was, who is he? Where are you? I cannot wait to hike that. I didn't even know it existed. That's the magic I live in. That's the magic I support the magic I look for, and I hope that you do pass that grant. Because this grant, no. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't prepared to speak, and I was told me to be here from 7 to 8, so I haven't eaten dinner yet. <laughs> My name is Marcy Wanker, and I live at 107 Black Birch Trail. Um, I've been a gardener at the Northampton Community Gar Gardener, sorry, not talking about gardens, since 1993 with just a few years off when I had a home garden at a different house. Um, I have had as many as three plots and I'm down to one plot and it's just dedicated to food. I'm an organic gardener and I know that not all the gardeners at the Community Garden are organic, but some of us would prefer to see it all organic, but um, to be using something sorry, uh, int intentionally is pretty upsetting to me. And I also, I don't know if she's still here, but I almost didn't plant my garden garlic either, and it's the one thing I always grow. You know, last year I had heart surgery, and the only thing I really had in my garden was gar garlic. And so I was really, after 22 years, I was like, do I give it up? Do I move to the other garden that's organic or do I continue? So I decided to plant it with good faith that we wouldn't hopefully go forward with this proposal. So um, I have spent a lot of time cultivating my plot and adding a lot of organic materials to it. So just so I, you know, one of the reasons I want to get just to, so that you can, um, sorry, my blood sugar is really going. To, to register my opposition to this plan. So I know there's been a lot of science submitted already, so I don't have to do that, thanks to Catherine. Um, but glycos gly uh, Roundup glycosate, I can't even say it, is, is actually known carcinogen. And it's not just the $289 million that was awarded, but there's a class action suit. And um, I'm a lymphoma survivor and um, they've only implicated it in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at this point, and I had Hodgkin's, but Hodgkin's is also caused by carcinogens. So I have no idea if, if you know, um, if Roundup has contributed to my cancer. But I would like to stay cancer-free, and, um, you know, it makes me really nervous to garden at this garden if this plan goes forward. So the other thing I wanted to say was I was also on the garden committee for 13 years and I resigned a year ago 
and I, I apologize if this was discussed and I don't remember it, but I don't remember this being such a big deal. Like it seemed to have kind of popped up very quickly. So I was surprised also, and if it weren't for Anne posting on Facebook, I wouldn't have known about this. Um, eventually I would have, because after the fact, the Garden Committee did send an email out to us. But by then we had, you know, we were kind of jumping into <coughs> gear. Um, but someone said earlier that the Garden Committee is not in favor of Roundup, and that's not completely true. I won't say the committee itself is in favor, but some members of the committee have used personally used Roundup on their own garden plot. And I know this because I can't tell you how many years ago, but we did bring it up as a possibility of making the garden free of Roundup, like banning it, and it was, it was knocked down by the garden committee. So anyway, um, but it doesn't mean that the rest of us should be subjected to that. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. <coughs> Hi, Daisy Royal. I live on both the neighbor and a garden member. So I moved here this winter. I got a plot. I had, my name is J.B. Royal. I live on Village Hill Road. I probably live closer to the garden than just about anybody. I dug my first uh, composter in 1955, learned organic gardening from my doc. My father was a doctor. I been an organic farmer off and on over my lifetime when I wasn't working. I've been a beekeeper. Last uh, few years, I've, the well, last 20 years, I've had worm composting. I've taught classes in Needham at the public schools and also at community farm events about how to build worm composters. I spent mm, two or three years on the League of Women Voters Committee, on the Water Resource Committee, battling with the town, trying to get them to not use Roundup. And I will clarify, there's been a lot of misinformation given out here tonight. Roundup and glyphosate are two different things. Think of Ovaltine, and it has 40 chem chemicals in there with brown dye number 22, and cocoa, one ingredient. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. Roundup has all sorts of other chemicals, surfacants, uh, adjuvants, these things that are meant to cause the glyphosate to hang on to the leaves and therefore kill the plant. So I moved out here, believe it or not. I used to spend for the last, for the <coughs> first five years in Needham, when I was active in this Water Resource Committee, I contracted with EWG, which is Environmental Working Group, and I got thousands of pamphlets delivered to the town to the Board of Health. And I also made up these bundles, and I would go from house to house. Whenever I saw a yellow pesticide sign, I'd read the chemical, and if they weren't adhering and it was on the sidewalk where my children walked to school, I would call the town officer and have them out there and then find out what landscape company did it. So you're talking about like a pesticide Nazi here, right? I'm, so here's the deal. Would I use glyphosate in my garden? Absolutely not. I have used chemicals, and I've used toxic chemicals on a very specific thing. So when I bumped into Ann about a week, uh, a week or so ago, I was led to believe by an email that I got forwarded that glyphosate, which is not as dangerous as everybody thinks, the surfacants and adjuvants, which are POEA, or I can't pronounce the chemicals, but I have read all 500 pages of the glyphosate Monsanto thing. It's mostly lies by scientists that, that got paid by them. But the fact is, it's the surfacants and adjuvants that make frogs turn from male to female, are endocrine disruptors which cause women to have all sorts of cancers. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that landscapers get are from all these things. Glyphosate, I don't know. But would I spray it anywhere? Absolutely not. Would I inject it into the roots? Yeah, on a very limited basis. Is it gonna travel horizontally? 
if water was traveling that way and it just so happened it was in quantities enough to travel, yes. Would I eat vegetables out of a garden with glyphosate? <laughs> Not a chance. So what I, I would like to see is you give money to this group, but the proposal has to be modified. It has to be modified to come up with a plan to do it manually or use some other chemical. I suggested, I wrote an email, I said, well, if you're going to dig all this out, why don't you plant sunflowers, which kill everything in their wake? They give out natural allopathic chemicals. If you've ever looked underneath a, a bird feeder, the sunflower seeds, nothing ever grows there. I don't know whether it will kill, not, kill knotweed, but I won't be using glyphosate, spraying. I would, I would support injecting it in very small quantities. I'm going to correct a few other things. You can't have a compost if you have 400 plots and people don't know what a one centimeter piece of a rhizome is. Because that's all it will take from knotweed, thrown like that. You could take your compost and it could be that big and you put it in your garden and like six months later you're going to have knotweed. So, it's almost like you can't ever use that compost again, and Anne referred to some mechanism to completely block it out. That's what I would suggest, and that's about all. I want one other thing. I'm in the direct wind path from the garden. I can see the garden from my apartment. Would I open the windows? I would want to know when they're gonna spray anything, because it's a real health habit hazard. So, a lot of people that moved into Village Hill are my age or older. We don't need, we, I moved out here for the healthy reasons, and I really think that somebody should rethink this whole proposal. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> my name is Paige Bridges. I live in Northampton. I want to register my opposition to the very idea of using public funds to purchase toxicants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. Deb Jacobs, 82 Grove Abbott in Leeds. I also um, garden up at the state hospital, and um, I, it's been more fun. I've had a wonderful time up there. I personally don't use uh, pesticides or herbicides in my garden, um, but I, I can see that there's a need to balance the problems of not weed and, and, and chemical, chemicals. And I, I, I think Adele put it very well um, when she was speaking. Um, I, I, believe, I believe that it's a very difficult, obviously, and divisive issue. But I, I don't see, I have seen, not we, unlike other people, um, there was some that came under the road and came up by the middle raised bed um, in the um, northeast um, area of the of the gardens. So uh, it, I know it can travel that far. Uh, I, I think historically it was the kitchen garden for the um, state hospital, and I'm sure they used lots of chemicals when they um, were growing things there. DDT, seven, all the, all the things that people were using back in the day. Um, and so there's, there are either already pesticides in the soil, um, although people have, have, have uh, done a lot enriching the soil. Um, but all of these community gardens, Grow Food Northampton, the Allards had to have used um, chemicals on their squash, and some of that stuff stays in the ground for a long time. It's very hard to be, to be pure, and I, I personally um, find
five years ago would never have uh, advocated use, using um, treating not weed, but people I respect have um, have have changed their mind and and now use it in limited targeted ways. So I I appreciate your um, having listened to so many of us, and it, it is something people are very passionate about, and you have to have to weigh the amount of money that you have with, with the request that the garden is making, along with the other ones, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Deb. Anybody else to speak? Can I speak very briefly? Uh, certainly. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Mimi Texanian. I'm a longtime community gardener and a longtime member of the garden committee. Um, and what I would like to say to you about, <coughs> I'm sorry about this proposal, is there are sometimes, I mean, it's lovely when your alternatives are both good and you have to pick the best. But sometimes neither alternative is good. You've got two bad alternatives. One of them is to allow <coughs> not we to take over the garden, which eventually it will. And the other is to use <coughs> glyphosate as part of a, a control and contain program. So it's a, it's a, it's a choice between two evils. My personal opinion is that having Japanese not weed take over the garden, which eventually it will, if it's not <coughs> controlled and contained, it will also spread to Village Hill. Nobody's pointed that out, but, <coughs> but a hard not weed stand is 30 feet from, the <coughs> from Village Hill. So, and that, as Arlene says, is a horror show. Yep, this, this life is sacred presents some problems. Yes, it does. But it seems to me <coughs> that the problems it presents are the lesser of the, yes, the greater. Which way is it? <laughs> the Japanese economy is the greater of the two problems. So I'm asking you to um, give preliminary, <coughs> excuse me, approval to this five-year grant to control the lobby. Thank you, Mimi. Anybody else on the community garden project? Okay, just a couple more items on the agenda. Uh, before we adjourn, other business not foreseen when agenda was published. I, I'm, gonna, I'm blowing past the <laughs> one before that, which is to begin the funding recommendation. <laughs> I think we're probably in one second. Um, other business not foreseen. Uh, okay, for the folks leaving, remember we will begin our uh, deliberation next Wednesday uh, here for all eight of the proposals. And as always, you're welcome to come any or to all of our meetings and then you can always follow our agenda. There's a question. There's a question. Um, that was exactly my question. So on Wednesday, this was a public comment meeting. Correct. Which meant that we were thankfully allowed to speak, but during your deliberations it's not a public input meeting. Correct. It's that we just get to be observant. Correct. And is that all, those who are present tonight are do a vote? Correct. I don't know your process. Yes. So our process is that the public is allowed to attend, but the public is not participatory in our deliberations. Um, they're participatory in this uh, in this public comment. In the same room? Correct. At what time? Uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday the 16th. Uh, I'm sorry, the 14th. And that's the final determination? No. Well, we'll see. Okay. Uh, ultimately, we are, uh, we are a recommending body. So it is city council who funds all CPC proposals. By vote? By vote. We can recommend a proposal and they can vote it up or down 
Uh, if we do thumbs down to a proposal, City Council cannot uh, uh, fund that. Fund that. So that ends that grant process for that particular grant? For that particular grant, at that particular site. And how many grants are you deliberating on Wednesday? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, other business not foreseen when agenda was published, just to remember that we are meeting next Wednesday. You should have it. And, uh, two weeks before it's given to you. Thanksgiving break. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? A second? All in favor? Thank you all very much for coming out. Thank you. 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 Thank you.